Hello everyone, you're welcome to Sankofa of an African series and my name is Gabriella. Well today we're going to be discussing someone who is pretty much legendary and she achieved something that seemed impossible. We're going to be discussing the first female pharaoh of Egypt, Hatshepsut. Now Hatshepsut was the fifth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty of Egypt. She ruled from 1479 to 1458 BCE. Now BCE actually stands for before the contemporary era. She was the first female ruler of ancient Egypt to reign as a male with the full authority of pharaoh. Hatshepsut is such a unique name and it means foremost of noble women or she is the first among noble women. She began her reign as regent to her stepson, Topmos III, who would succeed her and initially ruled as a woman, as depicted in statutory. In around the seventh year of her reign, however, she chose to be depicted as a male pharaoh in statutory and reliefs, though still referring to herself as female in her inscriptions. She reigned during a period known as the New Kingdom, which was from around 1570 to 1069 BCE, and is regarded as one of the best pharaohs Egypt ever had. Although she is sometimes cited as the first female ruler of Egypt, or the only one, there were women who reigned before her, such as Mer Neith, which reigned, who reigned around um, 3000 BCE in the early dynastic period, so Beknefru, who reigned from 1807 to 1802 BCE in the Middle Kingdom, and Twasret, who reigned after um, Hatshepsut toward the end of the 19th dynasty. Now Hatshepsut, who wasn't the first nor the last female ruler of Egypt, is undoubtedly the best known female ruler of ancient Egypt after Cleopatra VII and one of the most successful monarchs in Egyptian history. There's a bit of controversy around Hatshepsut, and the reason for this is that according to Egyptian tradition, no woman should have been able to assume the full power of Pharaoh, which was something that um, other female rulers of Egypt never did. Further, her name was erased from her monuments following her death, which strongly suggests that someone, most likely Tutmos III, wanted to remove all evidence of her from history. Later scribes never mentioned her, and her many temples and monuments were often claimed to be the works of later pharaohs. Her existence only came to light fairly recently in history, when the Orientalist Jean-Francois Champollion, who lived from 1790 to 1832, and is most famous for de deciphering the Rosetta Stone, found he could not reconcile hieroglyphics indicating a female ruler with statutory obviously depicting a male. These hieroglyphics were found in the inner chambers of Hatshepsut's temple at Deir el-Bari. All public recognition of her had been erased. Since the Egyptians believed that erasing one's memory from history hampered one's afterlife, it is believed that whoever removed her from public knowledge did not wish her ill after death and so preserved her name in more secluded areas. It has also been suggested that her name was simply overlooked in some places out of the public eye. Hatshepsut's building projects were numerous, after all, and it is certainly possible that those responsible for blotting her name out simply missed some. Efforts to erase Hatshepsut from memory were ultimately unsuccessful. However, as she is well known today as one of the greatest pharaohs of ancient Egypt, now let's take a look at Hatshepsut's early life and rise to power. Hatshepsut was the daughter of Thutmose I, who lived from 1520 to 1492 BCE by his great wife Amos. Thutmose I also fathered Thutmose II by his secondary wife, but no friend. In keeping with Egyptian royal tradition, Thutmose II was married to Hatshepsut at some point before she was 20 years old. During this same time, Hatshepsut was elevated to the position of God's wife of Amun, the highest honor a woman could attain in Egypt after the position of queen and actually bestowing far more power than most queens ever knew. 
Hatshepsut and Thutmose II had a daughter, Neferu Ra. While Thutmose II fathered a son with his le um, lesser wife, Isis. This son was Thutmose III, who was named his father's successor. Thutmose II died while Thutmose III was still a child, and so Hatshepsut became regent, controlling the affairs of state until he came of age. In the seventh year of her regency, though, she changed the rules and had herself crowned pharaoh of Egypt. She took on all the royal titles and names which she had inscribed using the feminine grammatical form, but had herself depicted as a male pharaoh. She still referred to her stepson as the king, but he was so in name only. Hatshepsut clearly felt she had as much right to rule Egypt as any man, and her depiction in art stressed this. Recognizing that she was in uncharted waters, Hatshepsut took steps to legitimize her reign quickly. If her position as pharaoh would, were to be challenged, she was not going to simply allow herself to disappear. Now, how did Hatshepsut attain the impossible position of pharaoh? In ancient Egypt, it was practically impossible for a woman to be pharaoh. So how did Hatshepsut attain this seemingly impossible feat? Well, according to Egyptologist Kara Cooney, the following reasons may have been possible. One of this could have been privileged birth as a princess, she was also the king's sister and the king's wife. Also, reliance on women in Egypt to act as decision makers for boy kings too young to rule, which was what um, saw Hatshepsut become pharaoh. She had, she had to act as regent to her stepson, Thutmose III. Another thing could have been a succession crisis within an authoritarian regime that demanded Hatshepsut's rule and the opportunity to take the throne alongside the boy king Thutmose III. The exact reasons for taking kingship are not clear, but when she became king, she took the title king and not queen. Now let's take a quick look at Hatshepsut's early reign. Hatshepsut began her reign by marrying her daughter to Thutmose III and bestowing on Neferu Ra the position of God's wife of Amun in order to secure her position. Even if she were now forced to relinquish power to Thutmose III, she would still be in a strong position as his stepmother and mother-in-law. And further, she had her daughter in one of the most prestigious and powerful positions in the land. These precautions were not enough. However, and she legitimized her reign by presenting herself not merely as Amun's wife in ritual, but as his daughter. She claimed that Amun had appeared to her mother in the form of Thutmose I and conceived her, thus making her a demigoddess. She furthered her legitimacy through reliefs on public buildings, showing Thutmose I making her his co-ruler, claiming that Amun had earlier sent an oracle predicting her rise to power and linking herself to the expulsion of the Hyksos some 80 years before. The Hyksos were a Semitic people who established themselves at Avaris in Lower Egypt and gradually assumed enough power to control the region. They were defeated and driven from Egypt by Amos of Thebes, which initiated the period of the New Kingdom. The later Egyptian historians regularly characterized the Hyksos, referred to as Asiatics, as hated tyrants who invaded Egypt, sacked temples, and desecrated shrines. Even though these claims were all either exaggerations or untruths, the Egyptian memory of the hated Hyksos was strong and Hatshepsut made good use of that. Now let's discuss Pharaoh Hatshepsut's exploits. In keeping with tradition, Hatshepsut set about commissioning and building projects such as her temple at Deir el Bari and sending out military expeditions. The exact nature of the military campaigns is unclear but the objectives were the regions of Syria and Nubia. It is likely that the campaigns were launched simply to uphold the tradition of Pharaoh as a warrior king, bringing wealth into the land through conquest. They could have also been a continuation of Thutmose I's campaigns in those regions, further legitimizing her position, or they could have been fairly provoked. The Pharaohs of the New Kingdom, the Age of Empire, placed great emphasis on keeping secure buffer zones around the country to avoid a repeat of what they saw as the invasion of the Hyksos. 
In all her projects, campaigns and policies, she relied on the advice and support of her, one of her courtiers, a man named Senenmut, whose relationship with the queen remains mysterious. Several statues show him holding Princess Neferu Ra, whose mentor and steward he became before her Shepsis accession. He was in charge of all of Hatshepsut's grandest projects, including her famous temple. Hatshepsut's greatest efforts went into these building projects, which not only elevated her name and honored the gods, but employed the people. The scope and size of Hatshepsut's constructions, as well as their elegant beauty, attest to a very prosperous reign. None of her projects could have been completed as they were if she were not in command of a wealth of resources. Hatshepsut's expedition to Punt, which is modern-day Somalia, was her crowning achievement in her own eyes. Punt had been a partner in trade since the time of the Middle Kingdom, but expeditions there were expensive and time-consuming. That Hatshepsut could launch her own expedition, especially one so lavish, is a testament to how prosperous her reign was. Now on to Hatshepsut's disappearance. While Hatshepsut had been ruling the country, Thutmose III had not been sitting quietly by watching. She gave him command of the armies of Egypt, and it has been suggested, most notably by Egyptologist James Henry Breasted, that he survived her reign by proving himself useful as her general, and more or less keeping out of her way. In about 1457 BCE, Thutmose III led his armies to put down a rebellion from Kadesh, which is known as the famous Battle of Megiddo a campaign possibly anticipated and commissioned by Hatshepsut, and afterwards her name disappears from the historical record. Thutmose III backdated his reign to the death of his father, and Hatshepsut's accomplishments as pharaoh were ascribed to him. When and how she died was unknown until recently. Egyptologist Zahi Hawass claimed to have located her mummy in Carius Museum's holdings in 2006. An examination of that mummy shows that she died in her 50s from an abscess following a tooth extraction. Thutmose III went on to become a great pharaoh known as the Napoleon of ancient Egypt for his brilliant military victories. Later in his reign, he had all evidence of his stepmother erased from monuments and all evidence of her reign destroyed. Neferu Ra had died long before and there was no one at court, it seems, who had the power or inclination to change this policy. The wreckage of some of these works was dumped near her temple at Deir el-Bari and excavation brought her name to light along with the inscriptions inside the temple which Champollion was so mystified by. Although there may have been many theories over years as to why Thutmose tried to blot Hatshepsut's name from history, the most likely reason was that her reign had been unconventional and departed from tradition. The pharaoh's chief responsibility was the maintenance of Mat, which is harmony and balance, and a woman in a man's position would have been seen as disruptive to that balance. The pharaoh served as a role model to his people, and it is possible that Thutmose III feared that other women might look to Hatshepsut for inspiration and try to follow her example, thereby departing from a tradition which maintained that men should rule Egypt and women should only be consorts, as it was in the beginning of time when the god Osiris ruled with his consort Isis. The Egyptian belief that one lives on as long as one's name is remembered, however, is exemplified in Hatshepsut. She was forgotten as the period of the New Kingdom continued and remained so for centuries. Once her name was found again by Champollion in the 19th century contemporary era and by others throughout the 20th, she gradually came back to life and assumed her rightful place as one of the greatest pharaohs in Egypt's history. So that's all for today. I would love you guys to tell me what amazing African female leader you would love to see me do next. And um, I'll be checking out for your responses in the comment section. So thank you so much for watching. Please share this video with your contacts. Subscribe to our channel and give us a huge thumbs up. Thank you. Bye.